think we can probably get started. Eh? Mm -hmm. Okay, I think it's uh, right now. It looks like we're we're top down. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, nice to meet you all. My name is Bill Armstrong, and I'm one of the founding partners at Never Second. Uh, we wanted to thank you all for attending our webinar entitled uh, "The Science Behind Modern Day Fueling." and Never Second products. Uh, we have hundreds of uh, brand partners uh, who are attending from uh, Europe, UK, US, uh, Canada, Middle East, Central and South America joining. And we want to thank you again uh, for being here with us uh, today. Uh, representing uh, the team from Never Second, uh, we have uh, Lauren Armstrong. Uh, we also have attending Marcus Peter uh, and Sean Everett as well. And we're also very pleased to present uh, our chief scientific uh, officer, Dr. Uh, Oscar Yeikendruch on the webinar as well. Uh, back in 2020, uh, when I started to think about Never Second as a brand idea, I was introduced to Oscar as one of the most influential uh, thought leaders and researchers in the field of performance nutrition for endurance athletes. Uh, one key question inevitably uh, came up uh, when Oscar and I met. Uh, the question was, in, the, in this highly cluttered world of, of performance nutrition, is there space for a brand like Never Second? Uh, what value uh, can we bring uh, to endurance athletes? As both a competitive athlete and researcher, Oscar has worked with thousands of athletes uh, over his career from everyone from world record holders uh, to uh, everyday athletes, gold medalists, um, and he assured me that regardless of, of uh, talent, uh, most endurance athletes uh, continued to fuel uh, incorrectly. Um, a lot of that has to do with factors for everything from uh, confusing messages from brand marketers, uh, arbitrary nutrient values in the products and inconsistent uh, product messages, um, as well as uh, inconsistent product compositions, uh, just to name a few. Uh, and the message of a lot of times are oversimplified. You know, a lot of brand marketers will say, you know, take a gel or take a drink as an example. Uh, so this ultimately became the challenge uh, for a brand uh, like Never Second. Uh, and also one of our, our key points of difference uh, to the market. The idea behind Never Second is to help athletes uh, really fuel correctly by combining both top quality evidence-based products with an easy to follow uh, navigation that is a blueprint for success. Ultimately, our goal is to provide athletes with a blueprint that helps them succeed uh, with their feeling both in training and thus in competition. Uh, and now with Never Second, uh, we're now uh, 17 months old. Uh, we've um, provided a system that allows athletes uh, to plan, perfect, and master their performance nutrition uh, more easily than ever before. Um, a few things before I turn, uh, turn the webinar over to Oscar. Uh, for the first 35 minutes or so, Oscar will present uh, pivotal studies and research that form the basis of Never Seconds products. During that time, uh, feel free to enter questions into the chat. Uh, in the second portion of the webinar, uh, we will answer your questions. Uh, if we're unable to answer any questions that you have, we will email you afterwards to answer your questions uh, offline. Uh, and now I give you uh, Oscar. Thank you very much, uh, Bill. If you can um, let me share my screen, then I'm going to start sharing okay. straight away. Okay. It is enabled. Should be good. Okay. Then hopefully everyone can see my screen now. Yes. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to start with giving you a little bit of sort of my background and how I got started in this field and how I got interested. Um, and then I'm going to take you on a little journey because that is also the journey that is the background to the products that uh, that were developed. Um, I got interested in sport and sports nutrition a little bit uh, later because of my own uh, interest in endurance sports mostly. I was a, I was a cyclist uh, in first instance and then later uh, did some running, uh, did some uh, triathlon, but that really sparked the interest. And at, at one point, I had to decide, do I want to go professional with cycling or 
do I go and study at a university? And I made the choice to study at a university. And I ended up at Maastricht University, uh, then spent a little bit of time as a postdoc in, uh, at uh, the University of uh, Texas at Austin. And then I ended up at this building here, or at least uh, opposite of these uh, buildings here, um, where I took a position at the University of Birmingham. And I was the director of the human performance lab there. That was really not much of a lab when I started very small. Um, but I had a really good uh, team and the team got bigger and bigger and we uh, published a lot of papers. And that is the goal when you're um, at a university or at least that is how success is measured. You're measured on how many publications do you have in what journals are those uh, publications. So it's all about being productive and sort of cranking out the studies and then the scientific publications. I did that for many years and then changed a little bit. And I'll explain in a little bit why, um, why I changed. Um, after that, I worked for a little bit in or for four years uh, at, the, uh, at, at Gatorade, uh, largest sports nutrition company in the, uh, in, in the world. And then I started as a consultant, my own uh, company, working with athletes and teams and organizations. Um, and then uh, very recently uh, started this venture with the Never Second. So going back to the publishing of papers, that's we did a lot of that, as I said, at the university. So it, you are, um, it's, it's all about the number and the quality of publications. And then you can summarize that in a uh, sports nutrition textbook, which, uh, which we've done. But the the issue with that that i found is that a lot of the science never actually makes it to the athlete so you do this with the purpose of helping athletes but then you see athletes are still making exactly the same mistakes as before the publication and even 10 years after the publication nothing has really changed so the science is there but something has gone wrong in that translation from the science to practice or at least it's never gotten to the athlete and there are good reasons why that is the case. Um, and here we have an example now with the, uh, with the World Cup uh, going on. We have an athlete here who says, hey, how do I get the ball in the bag of the net tomorrow? Is basically, athlete is interested in performance. He wants to win tomorrow. Then we have the uh, scientist here. This is, uh, this is me giving an answer and saying AMP kinase and glycogen phosphorylase, they might be connected, but also typical for a scientist that is usually followed with a sentence like, well, we need more studies before we can be definitive. So the first thing that you notice that this athlete has a completely different timeline than the scientist here. The athlete wants to win tomorrow. The scientist says, well, let's do some studies. And then in a few years time, hopefully we have enough studies so that we can actually come up with a conclusion. And that's part of why we have this gap between sort of science and uh, practice. Um, and I think in the last few years, we have made really good progress in bridging this gap, trying to speak the same language, because clearly, like these are two very different languages. But we're trying to bring these languages together and we're trying to come up with more practical solutions, but also more practical studies. And also we're trying to educate the athletes to think a little bit more like scientists. Um, and this is how this, our field is moving forward. And as Bill mentioned, I had the opportunity to work with um, a number of like great athletes that all had great questions that all had also big struggles in getting their nutrition right for various reasons because you can see very different athletes here on this uh, on on this screen so in the in the last few years so since i started um, my my sports science i've been consulting with a number of different uh, clients so um, red bull is amongst them uh, i'm head of nutrition for the dutch olympic uh, team um, i've worked with a number of uh, football teams or soccer teams um, Jumbo Visma is in this uh, in this list, um, 
And we're trying with that, we're trying to use the science to come up with answers that actually help athletes in the real world. So we're going to talk about how we got to the products, what is behind the, the products of Never Second. But I'm going to take you on that journey, the scientific journey that, uh, that I've gone through. And of course, in the time that we have, it's a, it's a very accelerated version of, of it. Um, what I want to get to is ultimately, how do you get to a good nutrition plan? And I think step one is the science. Uh, like the, um, the tagline for never second is science first, never second. Well, step one is the science. You need to have a basis that you make your decisions on. And that basis cannot be, or the packaging looks great, or the photos behind the uh, product look look great. It's got to be grounded in uh, science. Um, it's also very important. The science will help you to make decisions on what to spend time on and effort on, because there is so much nonsense in our field of sports nutrition. And I think focusing on the things that really make a difference is very important. Then the second step is you need to do your homework. If you're going to, I'll take an example, you're going to uh, complete an Ironman, you need to do your homework. You need to know um, where the feed stations are. You need to know what the weather conditions are likely going to be. You need to have an idea of the pace that you can bike and run. So the, this is all stuff that you can do well in advance. And then the third step is you need a system, a system of products that will help you. And I'll explain a little bit more later what I mean with that. So the system means the right products, combination products, and the right amounts at the right time. So today we don't have time to talk about all of these aspects, but we'll talk about the products uh, mostly. But that is a very important part of the system. Uh, and very often, the system that I'm talking about is missing when athletes uh, make a nutrition plan. Um, and then step four is another step that is often forgotten. That is, well, the nutrition for this Ironman, for example, doesn't start at the expo the day before. It starts many weeks before. The training starts many weeks before, but nutrition as well. So that is an introduction. Um, the science that we have and the science that we're going to talk today um, is mostly is, is carbohydrate recommendations for long, longer events. That's what I'm going to focus the, uh, the talk on. And we have these recommendations that uh, are basically a summary of like all the work that we and others have, uh, have done where the amount that we think you should take really depends on the duration of exercise. That is the most important factor. But I'm going to talk to you about the science behind all that. And I got interested in all of this uh, because, mostly because of this study. And this was a study by Ed Coyle, who, um, if, you, um, if you look at the top left here, you can see blood glucose concentration during uh, three to four hours of cycling at a like a reasonable intensity, like a moderate to high intensity. And you can see that with, with the placebo, there is a drop in the blood glucose concentration. So if you ingest water, this is what happens with your blood glucose. And at some point, you just cannot maintain that intensity anymore. But if you take carbohydrates, it never really drops to very low levels. And you can go, in this case, an hour longer. That's quite significant. You can see if you look at the carbohydrate use as a fuel, you can see exactly the same pattern. It drops if you drink water and with carbohydrate, it was maintained. So this is like many years ago. Now, uh, there are many, many studies that have confirmed this and we, we know all of this. But I'm just showing you this because A, it shows carbohydrate actually works and B, it was the study that got me interested in this whole field. And we then started to do studies that were based on one assumption. That is, if you can get more carbohydrate into the body, that should help performance. Um, and at the time, we didn't have the evidence for that. It was just an assumption. Um, 
later, and I'll just show you one of the studies that we have now, where um, carbohydrate intake and performance actually do seem to be correlated. So if you can get more carbohydrate into the body, it will actually result in better performance. Um, there may be a tipping point at some point, because at some point, too much carbohydrate is just going to cause stomach problems and, and all sorts of problems, and that's not going to help performance. But the more you can tolerate, basically, um, the more um, your performance is going to be improved. So that was the assumption. So then we needed a, a method to measure how much carbohydrate do I actually use when I'm running or cycling or doing some other activity? And here's an example of how that test is done. Sorry. I've got automatically uh, forwarding slides or uh, slides that go back. But if we give a carbohydrate solution here, and these are the carbohydrates, and we label those carbohydrates, we can then, after the carbohydrate is digested and absorbed and oxidized and it becomes carbon dioxide in the expired gases, we can then measure that label in the expired gases. Now, the label that we use um, is a carbon-13, slightly heavier um, molecule of, of that carbohydrate. Um, Technical, not very uh, important for, for the story, but the fact is that if we give the label here in the carbohydrate, we can measure that label in the CO2. And you can imagine if you measure more uh, label in the expired CO2, it means that more of your carbohydrate must have been used. So that's a technique that we used. And you can then compare, for example, two different carbohydrates, glucose and galactose. I'm going to concentrate on the red line, glucose first. So these studies are typically two hours of exercise, sometimes three, sometimes five. And you give every 15 minutes or so, you give a drink um, or a gel or uh, another source of carbohydrate. And over the first 60 to 90 minutes, you can see that gradually it's being absorbed and it's being utilized by the muscle. There's an increase in the use of the carbohydrate, and we call that exogenous carbohydrate oxidation. After about 90 minutes, there's no further change. It's You've reached a maximum, you've reached a plateau, it doesn't uh, change. We call this the maximum oxidation rate. Now, if we compare glucose to galactose, like the immediate observation is, of course, galactose is much lower. So we've ingested the same amount of carbohydrate, but we don't use as much so for me, glucose would be the preferred drink because we want to use as much of the carbohydrate as possible. And we want as little as possible of the carbohydrate sitting somewhere in the GI tract. So now this slide um, is very important and a little bit more complicated. But what you see here is on the horizontal axis is the intake in grams per minute. So from no intake, zero to three, grams per minute that is 180 grams per hour um, that is an amount that i would say never uh, even go near there uh, it's way too high but for experimental purposes it can be done and then we have a lot of studies here each dot is one study we have a lot of studies here around one gram per minute on the vertical axis we can see how much of the carbohydrate that was ingested is actually used. And the blue line here represents the general trend. Initially, if you ingest more, your body uses more. But if you ingest more than roughly one gram per minute, maybe 1.2 grams per minute, then it maxes out. So in this case, where you're ingesting three grams per minute, you're only um, using one gram per minute so two grams per minute is somewhere in your body where it's not uh, being beneficial so we believed at the time this was the absolute maximum that you could achieve and all the guidelines even today still you often read that the guidelines are up to 60 grams an hour and it comes from these studies it comes from this observation that if you ingest more than 60 grams an hour 
it, it's not actually utilized. So what we started to do is look at where is this limitation? Why can we not use more than 60 grams an hour? With the idea in the back of our mind, if we can solve this, if we can increase it, then we can deliver more carbohydrate to the muscle and improve performance. The first barrier for any carbohydrate that we take in is the stomach. Now, we measured gastric emptying and we knew the stomach is not the limiting factor. We can, we can um, empty way more than 60 grams per hour from the stomach. We also initially skipped over the um, GI tract or the, or the intestine because the textbooks still today are telling us the capacity to absorb glucose by the intestine is unlimited. Um, that's not true. So I'll come back to that in a minute. The, um, the other barriers could be that somehow the liver traps all this glucose so the muscle never sees it or the glucose cannot go into the muscle uh, fast enough or the muscle cannot use it. We excluded all those factors. Um, so we had to go back to the intestine. Now here I've sort of blown up, really zoomed in on the intestine. This is the inside of the intestine. This is the blood here on the right-hand side. And this is the, um, the wall of the intestine. And for this glucose here to absorb, we need to pass this wall. And it has two membranes, one here, one here. And it's not as simple as just moving through the membrane. You need a transporter to get the glucose from this side to this side. And then you need another transporter on the other side. So what it looks like is this. Glucose is absorbed by this transporter, ends up in the circulation. Um, but when we ingest very large amounts of glucose, more than 60 grams per hour, what we think happens is it starts to accumulate on this side. So you can still get 60 grams an hour into the blood, but the remaining uh, glucose is just accumulating in the intestine and very likely will be the cause of some GI problems later on. So if we want to get more carbohydrate into the blood, then what we need to do is find another transporter. There is another transporter, it's called GLUT5, and it transports fructose. So in theory, we developed this idea that if we combine glucose and fructose, and we give them at the same time, we should be able to get more than one gram per minute or 60 grams per hour into the blood. So we designed a study, which I'll show you next. In this study, Again, we had two hours of exercise. We looked at the use of the carbohydrate from a drink. We gave three drinks. The first one was a moderate amount of glucose. The second one was a very large amount of uh, glucose. The first one was enough or should be enough to saturate that glucose transporter. The second one is way more than that. And then the third drink was the same amount of carbohydrate as the high glucose but this time with the mixture of glucose and fructose, trying to use the two um, mechanisms. So if I show you the results of the medium glucose first, then this line is very similar to what we saw before for glucose, very similar. So initially an increase and then a plateau after about 90 minutes and a maximum value roughly uh, of 0.8. Now, when we um, increase the amount of glucose, then based on what I've just been telling you, you can predict what, uh, what we will see. And indeed, we saw exactly the same response. So even though we're ingesting 50% more, there's no further use of the carbohydrate. Then the next one where we give glucose and uh, fructose, um, that had uh, the same amount of glucose than the medium glucose, and therefore oxidation of that glucose was the same. But that drink also contained fructose. Uh, so if you add up now the total amount of carbohydrate that was used, for the first time, this study showed that we can go over this one gram per minute. Um, and actually quite a bit, because it is about 25% higher than what we thought was theoretically possible. And it was 50% higher than the uh, equivalent uh, in glucose in the same study. 
So that was very exciting, but it was only the beginning. So you can see a whole series of studies that followed after that, because then we're trying to figure out what is the maximum value? Um, what is the best combination of carbohydrate? So these first three purple bars, they come from the study that I've just shown you, where we gave glucose and then uh, a larger amount of glucose. So this gray area here represents how much glucose was ingested and the colored part of that bar is how much was actually utilized. So you can see much more was ingested, but not more was used. And then 1.26 grams per minute was the result when we uh, gave 1.8 grams per minute with glucose and fructose. When we gave glucose and sucrose, well, very similar results. Um, this one is really interesting because uh, we gave 1.8 grams per minute and we saw 1.5 grams per minute of oxidation. And the reason why I think it's really interesting is, first of all, that this value, of course, is very high, 1.5 grams per minute, incredibly high. But I'm more excited about it because this part here, the gray part, which is the, the part of the carbohydrate that is not used and maybe sitting in the GI tract, that's very small. Um, and therefore, uh, very likely that you get less GI problems. We then wanted to know, well, what happens if you go even higher with your intake to maybe 2.4 grams per minute? That's 144 grams in an hour. So it's like crazy, crazy amounts. Um, and in the first study, that really did not work. Um, but then in two... Um, further studies we found 1.7 and 1.75 grams per minute so and these are the still the highest values ever reported in the in the literature and in theory this should work quite well because you can deliver enormous amount of uh, carbohydrate but um, it will probably come at a cost because these gray bars are quite large or relatively large especially compared to this and the 2.4 grams per minute or 144 grams per hour is just really not very practical at all. Um, in fact, even the 1.8 grams per minute, um, I don't think is very practical for most athletes. Um, but one thing we had not answered is, um, does it actually help performance? So we've shown that you can get more carbohydrate into the body and your body uses it. But unfortunately, there are no medals for exogenous carbohydrate oxidation. There are medals for going faster. And we, so we did one study that was five hours of exercise. Just imagine five hours cycling in a, in a lab, uh, drinking um, a sugar solution, another sugar solution that had glucose and fructose, or just water. Um, and you can see this blue line is water. Um, they didn't, didn't actually make the full uh, five hours with that. Um, and here you can see the, the RPE, the ratings of perceived exertion. So that is like when people are asked, how hard is it? Then there's a one really interesting observation. For the first three hours where they're exercising at a moderate intensity, it really doesn't matter whether you drink water or, or a carbohydrate solution. It's all fine. But after that, you can see after those three hours, you can see that those lines start to diverge and you see it go up with water more and then suddenly they, they just can't do it anymore. Um, with glucose and fructose, that is this lower um, red line, um, it seems that the perception of effort was lower than with the, uh, the glucose. And then another observation that we made is that the self-selected cadence, which um, for the cyclists on the, on the call, that is very often also a sign of fatigue when you see the cadence of a, of a cyclist uh, drop. Um, you can see that it dropped most with water followed by glucose and then followed by glucose and fructose. So this still doesn't tell us that performance was improved, but it was definitely the first indication that it may actually work. Um, we then did another study where we exercised cyclists for three hours, two hours at a moderate intensity, and then they had to ride a 40-kilometer time trial, like all out. 
And we gave him placebo, glucose, and glucose, and fructose. So let's focus on these bars first. Um, with glucose compared to placebo, there was a 9% improvement in performance. Now, that is basically confirming many other studies that, that are out there. Um, if the exercise is really hard and the exercise is really long, carbohydrate is going to have a massive effect, 9.1%. But that makes it maybe even more surprising that if you give this glucose and fructose mix, on top of that 9% improvement, there's a further like almost 8% improvement in performance. So the mixture of glucose and fructose really helps performance and it does it more than any like normal like sports drink or uh, carbohydrate solution that contains just one type of carbohydrate. Um, the question that we then got was a practical one. Well, if you're advising 90 grams an hour or even more, can this actually be done? And the answer at the time was, uh, going back in time quite a bit, um, this is Chrissy Wellington. This is her intake during her uh, Ironman World Championship win. I think she's one of the first athletes who actually had an intake that was this high. But she achieved 775 grams of carbohydrate intake during the race. And that is pretty close to the 90 grams an hour that, uh, that we were targeting at the time. So the answer, can it be done? Well, yes, I think she showed that even for a small like female athlete, it can be done. Now we know that it can be done because a lot of athletes are uh, using the same uh, methods. Another interesting observation from Ironman um, was this study where we took quite a large number of athletes. We monitored their uh, intake. And then we plotted that here against the uh, finish time. So finish time is here in minutes. Uh, so a smaller number means faster finish time. And the carbohydrate intake is on the horizontal axis in grams per hour. So we have the slowest athlete here was 1644. Uh, and the fastest was 854. Um, that is very likely that that's Chrissy Wellington. But uh, we saw uh, this correlation here. Faster finishers had a higher carbohydrate intake or higher carbohydrate intake resulted in a faster finish. Now, with these sort of correlations, you can never say that one caused the other. But I think it's still a really interesting observation. So we had a very wide range of carbohydrate intakes, somewhere from about 25 grams per hour all the way to over 120 grams an hour. Um, and generally, you see that more carbohydrate means better performance. So I'm wrapping, wrapping up now with, uh, I'm showing you this um, for practical reasons, because we then wanted to uh, answer a number of very practical questions. Like, how do, you, do I get to this 90 grams an hour? Uh, do I take gels? with water or do I take a carbohydrate drink or should I take energy bars uh, or can I combine them now in one study we compared gels versus a sports drink uh, both had glucose and fructose both were ingested at a rate of 1.8 grams per minute and you can see there really is no difference whatsoever between gel with water and this sports drink so it doesn't matter whether you uh, use gels or drinks. The second study here um, shows something very similar with energy bars ingested with water versus this sports drink. And maybe um, you can see that the bar here is a little bit slower than the, uh, than the drink, um, but it was not significant. And I, I would not worry too much about this. So if you prefer if you're an Ironman triathlete and you prefer to have a little bit of solid food occasionally, I would not worry about this uh, small difference here. So I think from these studies together, we conclude that you can actually mix and match. So you set your carbohydrate target and then whether you get it from gels or energy bars or drinks, that's really down to personal preference. And also a little bit down to, of course, the part that we haven't talked about, and that is your fluid requirements. Um, 
so that's that's a whole uh, different webinar uh, there. But uh, at some point, of course, you need to match. Uh, well, you you need to match your carbohydrate requirements, but also your fluid requirements. One point I want to mention on this energy bar: the the bar that we used here was very low in fat, fiber, and protein. As soon as you start to increase the fat, fiber, and protein content, this line will go down because it will slow down gastric emptying. It will slow down the absorption of the carbohydrate. Um, it will also slow down the delivery of fluid. So you want a bar that is low in fat, fiber, and protein. So we're back to this chart um, that we put together on like many years of uh, research in this area and uh, not just studies that we've done but many many others um, and we typically divide this so on the horizontal axis here you you have the uh, the time of your exercise so if you um, have an event that is longer than three hours then you should be looking in this area if your event is between one and two hours then you should be looking in this area and probably uh, aim for an intake around 30 grams per hour. Two to three hours, it's sort of in between, but you can get away with 60 grams an hour. But longer than two and a half, you may start to think about uh, going a little bit higher, 90 grams an hour. And this really is somewhat independent of the level of athlete you are. So if you're a professional athlete or like a a serious uh, age grouper or someone who's just a little bit uh, a little bit slower than that i think these guidelines are um are the same for for all those um, athletes um if you decide to go higher and go 90 grams an hour it's very important that you have the multiple transportable carbohydrates and also that you practice this and not just go to your very important race that you've trained for the whole year and you're going to try out your new uh, nutrition strategy in that race unfortunately that is one of the mistakes that is still very often uh, made by athletes even very intelligent athletes so um now let's convert this into the products um what we've done is of course, based on the sort of the composition of the drinks that I've shown you, like all, all of the never second products have this ratio of carbohydrate. Um, the recommendations that we use are 30, 60 or 90 grams uh, per hour, depending on um, on the duration. There may be situations where you want to go higher. Um, there may be reasons why you want it slightly differently, but that's what we used as the the basis for the uh, for the products um each serving therefore is also 30 grams of carbohydrate so every product has the same carbohydrate ratio of uh, glucose and fructose and serving sizes are in 30 grams or multiples thereof and we call um 30 grams a unit so we have products that have one unit and we have products that have three units, or we call them C30 and C90. Um, so this is the uh, the drink uh, powder. So that's comparable to many of the sports drinks on the uh, on the market. We have um, a number of gels. So you can see this gel here is C30, 30 grams of carbohydrate, same um, same carbohydrate mix. Um, all of the products also have uh, 200 milligrams of sodium. Uh, the topic of sodium is also a whole new uh, webinar that we can spend some time on uh, sometime, but uh, 200 milligrams of sodium is sort of the, the better compromised, I think, of uh, you don't need as much sodium as people sometimes uh, think. Um, there's also a range uh, or, or two gels that are same in composition but they have a plus behind the c30 and the plus means 75 milligrams of caffeine there is also a reason why it's 75 milligrams of caffeine and not less or not more um, not less is that 
if you have a dose of 25 milligrams, which some gels have, it's almost impossible to get to levels that will actually impact performance. So it then becomes more of a marketing uh, thing rather than something that is really going to help you. If you go higher to maybe 100 uh, milligrams, then there is a real danger, especially in longer events, that you actually get way too much caffeine. And that is, of course, mostly athletes who like don't realize how much caffeine they're actually taking in. So that's uh, 75. It's, you, can, you can get to an effective dose, but it's really difficult to overdose. That's the, uh, the reason. Now, this is um, probably my favorite uh, product, the one that I use the most, this uh, C90. Three units in one serving. So that goes all in one bottle. Um, and then on a long bike ride, um, but also on, uh, on runs, this works really well. Um, you have a lot of energy in, uh, in just the one uh, bottle. Again, the same uh, carbohydrate composition, uh, neutral pH, the same amount of sodium. Uh, and those are sort of the carbohydrate products. I think with those, you in, in almost any, well, in any circumstance, where, depending on what the weather conditions are and the duration of the event, you can meet your carbohydrate needs as well as your fluid needs. And that's basically how it was designed. Um, I have one, one more to show, um, but I'm not going to talk about this. So this is the, uh, the protein uh, drink, because after exercise, the, uh, the recovery starts in here. We've also gone for sort of the highest quality of ingredients with a lot of evidence to back up that this product will actually stimulate uh, protein synthesis, but again, um, another uh, topic for another webinar. So I think, um, Bill, I'm going to hand back over to uh, to you there, um, and hopefully that was a bit of a summary of the science behind Never Second. Thanks very much, Oscar. We really appreciate it, and uh, always fascinating to uh, when when I hear this. I've heard it several times, and it's uh, every time I hear it, it just rings a bit more true each time. And I think for a lot of athletes, just hearing it from you, they'll never look at uh, the fueling the same way again. Um, we have a, a bunch of questions that are coming through. And at the same time, if you have any questions uh, for us, please feel free to enter them into the chat and we can address them uh, one by one. We have about uh, 30 minutes remaining. Um, so um, right now we have uh, five or six questions. Again, feel free to enter them in the chat uh, while, while we're addressing the existing questions. Uh, first question we have uh, is from Zavi. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Um, it says, studies about uh, carbohydrate oxidation have been done on elite athletes or amateur athletes. Also, are there studies uh, that look at carbohydrate oxidation after training the gut? Mm -hmm. Good, really good question. So <clears throat> I think they have been done mostly in well-trained athletes not elite, um, but like pretty, uh, pretty high level. Um, I showed you a couple of examples of, uh, of athletes in that presentation where we have actually done these, uh, these measurements. We've also done a, like a comparison um, where we directly looked at uh, elite athletes, uh, well-trained athletes, and then uh, non-athletes really. And um <clears throat> somewhat surprising maybe for uh, for some of you we did not see any differences between those um, between those groups we um we called them untrained athletes so there are actually two studies that we've done where we compared what we called untrained athletes versus well trained athletes um but these studies were done in holland and in holland uh, everyone uh, cycles so the uh, the comments that we got on this paper was like, whoa, those are untrained uh, people. Yes, they are, because these are people who only use their bikes to commute. Then they're not training for, uh, for anything. So they were untrained. <laughs> but compared to other studies, they may have been reasonably uh, trained. Um, there's only one study that have really looked at carbohydrate oxidation after training the gut. 
uh, two studies now, um, like one is fairly recent. And they see that if you do like very sort of consistent uh, training of the gut, which means uh, just having a high carbohydrate intake during most of your uh, training, at least that's what it meant in those uh, studies, you can see an increase in exogenous carbohydrate uh, oxidation after uh, two, two to four weeks. Um, so yes, training the gut will help, will increase the capacity of the gut to absorb carbohydrates. So, and that's, that could be very beneficial, beneficial because you're delivering more carbohydrate, but also because you're probably reducing, uh, the negative effects on, um, uh, GI problems. So good questions. Excellent. Um, here uh, we have a, a range of questions as well, Oscar, from uh, Stephen Galibert, in, uh, who I know very well. We communicate pretty often. I'm going to try and uh, address one by one here. Some of them are um, Stephen's ideas about what we should come up with next, but let's just uh, maybe we can use form it into a question where we can. Um, this one's a little bit tricky. It says, um, do you propose products uh, based on electrolytes without sugar and with caffeine to work on nutritional periodization. Um, yeah. Do, what, yeah, let's hear your. Yeah, maybe let's take them one at one at a time. I think it's okay. a really interesting uh, one, and uh, um, I think we we have been talking about uh, doing a product uh, like that, but at the same time, uh, because I think there is there is a. Um, there is a value in having a product that has no calories, um, that has no calories and maybe caffeine. And that's sort of where this question came from. So sometimes you want to train with low carbohydrate, but you still want to consume something. Um, the, um, the question that I have with that is whether or not electrolytes really are important in that, uh, in the, in that product. Um, I already mentioned that once we get into that topic, it's a whole, um, that's probably a whole new uh, webinar where I can explain that a little bit more. Um, but, but I do think that <clears throat> the, like the way athletes think about, or athletes, everyone seems to think about electrolytes. It's, um, it's not really based on uh, science. It's based on the marketing of some early uh, science work um, and if you actually go back to what those studies say and if you actually go in the literature to find studies that show that if you take electrolytes it's gonna improve something then it's really difficult to find or impossible for example um, if you look at the literature and try to find a study that shows that electrolytes have an effect on performance you can actually find five studies of those five studies, four studies showed no effect on performance. And one study showed an astronomical effect <laughs> on performance so much that, yeah, you, you wouldn't believe it. Um, and the reason that they probably found it is that the, uh, they did it in a real life event where they had two groups. And they just looked at finish time as the measurement of, uh, of performance. And then, of course, yeah, if the one group has a few faster athletes, then they're going to be faster. So uh, definitely a lot to say about the, um, uh, the, the way the study was done. But um, so, yeah, I think there is a role for a product that has no carbohydrate. Uh, I think we can debate whether um, it should have electrolytes or not. Um, and I do think that caffeine in that case uh, could help um, because if you for a couple of reasons. The most important one is probably it will help you to maintain the intensity of exercise, which would probably drop if you don't uh, take carbohydrate. But caffeine can help you to maintain that a little bit. Um, and the other possible factor would be that during lower intensity work, uh, caffeine could maybe help to increase fat burning a little bit as well. Excellent. Thank you, Oscar. Um, one other, well, here's a great question. There's a question that I can actually answer. Uh, Stephen is asking, um, uh, why not set up and create some bars? Well, um, 
that's a great question, Stephen, and uh, it's on our minds. And it's something that you can expect from us in 2023. So we're very excited about it, but um, that's all we're gonna tell you for now. They're coming. So we'll leave it at that. Uh, next question from Stephen. That's an interesting question. I think um, it's about why we've, it really speaks to why we've chosen 30 gram increments. Stephen's asking why not set up gels with a higher carbohydrate content as 45 grams as, as opposed to 30. Isn't that just a matter of ultimately um, size, Oscar, like portability at some point? Yeah, I think it's, it's a practical a practical reason more than anything. Um, it's, it's like our, the gels now have 30 grams, which is more than the vast majority of uh, gels in the, in the market. Um, so you already get people saying, oh, this gel is a bit bigger than the rest. Yes, it is, because it, it also contains uh, 30 grams of carbohydrate instead of 20 or 25. Um, so yes, yeah, no, no surprise that it's bigger, but, um, I'm, I'm afraid that sort of the perception of a, uh, 45 gram carbohydrate gel would be like, well, this thing is huge, yeah. uh, because it's not just 45 grams, right? It's 45 grams plus the water content and the volume. So it's, of course, yeah. absolutely. Uh, next question comes from another, uh, definite fan of the brand, uh, Nicholas Ludwig, who asks, um, I'll read it. Uh, thank you for the webinar. I'd be curious to know why most studies have been done with glucose plus fructose, while never second or maltodextrin plus fructose could be beneficial to use one to one glucose plus fructose or two to one to one glucose plus fructose plus sucrose if the stomach can tolerate it as they've been shown as the best options in terms of overall carbohydrate oxidation. Yep. Yeah, so this goes back to that uh, to that um, uh, diagram that I showed, where we ingested 2.4 grams uh, per minute, and then showed very high oxidation rates with uh, a one-to-one -one glucose and fructose, and and the different uh, the different uh, mixes. And I think it's it's mostly like that was done with 2.4 grams per minute. Um, and I I I think if you are ingesting 2.4 grams per minute, I would probably suggest that you take this ratio of one, one to one instead of two to one, um, because it may it may be slightly better. Um, but the reality is that very few people are going to go even close to uh, close to that. Um, and in fact, we struggle for the majority of athletes to even push them to 90 grams an hour. Now, if 90 grams an hour, which is what this idea is built on, then I think you're better off with a two to one ratio than with a one to one ratio or like a different mix of carbohydrates. Um, maltodextrin and fructose was the, the study where the gray part, the part that wasn't, um, that was just sitting in the, in the stomach or in the intestine was very small. Um, so that's why uh, it, it's based on that. And the other reason is that maltodextrin, um, we, we haven't really talked about taste here. So if you have something, glucose and fructose, you can do this in a lab where you basically, you pay your subjects and they drink whatever you uh, give them and they perform and they go home uh, after several tests with, uh, with a little bit of money in their pocket and students are very happy. Um, that's quite different than actually turning that into a product that you can consume in competition. Um, so I think glucose and fructose, if you use that as the basis, it would be incredibly sweet. Um, and I think maybe, like I've only shown a few studies of what was done. There are many studies that all have also used different combinations of carbohydrate. And usually when I talk about glucose and fructose, um, I do mean all of the carbohydrates that behave like glucose. And maltodextrin actually behaves identical to glucose. So if I give someone 90 grams an hour of maltodextrin or 90 grams an hour uh, of glucose, I will get exactly the same results. And that is because it takes no time to break down the maltodextrin to digest it. It's really not a limiting factor whatsoever. Um, so I would, I often refer to all of these carbohydrates that behave like that as glucose, because 
they are like glucose. Well, that's great, Oscar. Thanks for that. It's um, I have to say a lot of a lot of uh, comments we hear from athletes is about how they really enjoy the flavor of the product, and I, th I think that can't be um, can't be minimized. It's important when you're consuming a lot of it. <laughs> so yeah. thanks for that. Uh, next question we have. Oh, this. Uh, so we're going to have to be nice in this one. What is your opinion about hydrogel? <laughs> yeah, so, <clears throat> yeah, I think it's, it's, it's interesting. And I, the, um, the technology is kind of, is, is interesting for a number of applications. In, in this case, I think the hydrogel can help gastric emptying. Um, but I've also shown you that gastric emptying isn't really the limiting factor. Um, and the study, so then the question is, does hydrogel affect absorption? Uh, that's very unlikely. Um, so then we have to go into the literature and we have quite a few studies now on, um, uh, on hydrogels and their effects on various uh, physiological processes and, and also on, uh, on performance. Uh, a very recently, like a review of the whole area was, uh, was published where they summarize all of the studies. And that's, of course, stronger than just looking at one, uh, one particular study and, and seeing what they found. Um, the review concluded that there really wasn't enough evidence to, uh, to uh, use hydrogel at, uh, at, at this point. Um, I think it does something to sort of the, maybe the flavor profile or the way you consume it or, or whether you like it or not. Some people like it, some people don't. Um, but in terms of functionality, I think um, it still needs to be seen if it actually uh, makes a difference. So that that review, yeah, it's just it's, it's not really that old. It's a few weeks old. Uh, concluded that uh, at the moment, there's just not enough evidence. Next question uh, comes from uh, Mariana Daldos. Uh, is the type of water uh, used important? Um, yeah, good, good question. Now, um, if you um, if you want to um, make a hydrogel, or then it is very important. So that that's uh, something that's often overseen. So yeah, then you have a product that works with a certain type of water. But if you have the wrong water, it doesn't actually form a hydrogel. But in in general, it doesn't matter. Um, Water is uh, water is water, and water varies in terms of electrolyte content um, a, a little bit. Um, it can vary in chloride uh, content and 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 in in taste, but other than that, it really doesn't functionally. It doesn't matter. Next question is uh, from Jeffrey Bowens. <clears throat> How long should you take to build up to ninety, uh, 90 grams an hour? recommendation um so i guess what is your generalized guideline for uh for gut training oscar yeah good good question so <clears throat> of course that depends a little bit on what your starting point is if you struggle to <clears throat> ingest 25 grams um well 90 grams a, mi a minute by the way is a bit high but it's per hour of course but uh, if you start with 25 grams <clears throat> per hour and you find that a lot then it'll take a while before you can build up to 90 grams an hour but if you have no problems consuming 70 grams an hour then it really doesn't take that long so i would always start with uh doing a test and the test should be something similar to what your competition is and just take a lot of carbohydrate with you and try to consume uh well not as much as possible but uh pretty close to that uh you shouldn't you shouldn't feel sick but also it shouldn't be comfortable um and the amount of carbohydrate you can ingest per hour during that sort of training session that is your starting point um, and in my experience for many athletes it it is below 60 grams an hour so they still have way to go to 90 grams uh, an hour. Um, and then I would build up every week with about 10 grams an hour. So um, if you feel you can make bigger steps, you can do that. But typically 
10 grams an hour is doable um for for most people um so that's that's what i would do and i if your goal is really to take 90 grams an hour in a race i would actually in training go higher than that and i would make sure that i would be comfortable with 100 grams an hour and then for the race i would actually come back to 90 because we all know that racing and training is not the same very few people get gi problems in training a lot of people get gi problems in uh, with racing so um, the amount you can tolerate in the race is not the same maybe because the intensity is just a little bit higher and maybe because uh, because of nerves uh, all, all plays a role so. question comes from alfredo cruz oscar is there a practical way to know your carbohydrate oxidation rate or is it a bit of trial and error i guess it points to the question of how much individual differences are there in athletes yeah so yeah so if i answer the question directly um there is no uh practical way um but the way you um phrase the question i think is there a lot of variation the answer is no there is surprisingly little variation uh between people like that that's one of the like i've done hundreds and hundreds of these uh, measurements and um no matter what we did we couldn't get over like one gram a minute initially in all of these studies and um I've, I've shown you a few studies here where like i've shown you a study where uh, glucose was used completely different subjects and they ended up at oxidation rates of 0.8 and then two years later or three years later a completely different study with different subjects and uh, but the protocol was the same and you find exactly the same uh, oxidation rates so very little individual variation is, is quite remarkable, really. And we, we think that is because our intestines really behave pretty similar and our diets are really not that different. And I think if you have, if you take individuals that have very different uh, sort of dietary habits, for example, individuals that uh, avoid carbohydrate in their, in their diet completely, I think that that's where you're going to see quite big differences or relatively big differences. Yeah. And further to that, Oscar, do you see uh, a lot of times we get the questions about men versus women or weight? How do those play a role, if at all? You know, differences between men and women, differences yeah. between heavier athletes versus lighter athletes? Yeah. So um, we've directly compared men and women. And uh again no difference at all like in in exogenous carbohydrate oxidation rates that's that's what i'm talking about now so really doesn't matter at all um the weight also doesn't make a difference so like a very like big heavy athlete and a very small sort of male or female uh athlete same exogenous carbohydrate oxidation rates and again we think that is because um functionally the intestine is the same and that is the limiting factor so in the muscle may be very different and the amount of muscle may be very different but if the delivery to the muscle is the limiting factor the, and there is no difference there then that explains why you will all, always see one gram a minute as a maximum value for small or for larger athletes and maybe a really interesting uh, point is we 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 wrote a paper about this um it's quite a few years ago now that therefore um like really light marathon runners are actually at an advantage because relatively speaking they get and get more of their energy uh, from the drink than a much larger runner so it's it's one of the uh, so they can benefit more from the drinks than uh, than someone with a higher body weight interesting Question, this question comes in from uh, Mariana Daldal. She asks, uh, do you recommend a gel 40 minutes before an Ironman with or without caffeine? What is your, your guidance on pre-Ironman, pre-swim protocol for carbohydrate intake? Yeah, if you said five to 10 minutes before, I would say yes, that's what I would do. 40 minutes before is probably what I would avoid. 
Um, and that has to do with uh, your response and blood glucose. So if you take it 40 minutes before, you have a chance that by the time you, you, you really uh, dive into the water, your insulin is really high. And insulin will make sure that glucose disappears into all sorts of tissues, uh, also the muscle. And then you start swimming and the muscle then demands more glucose. And suddenly, like a lot of glucose will disappear from the circulation, which means your blood sugar level uh, could, could drop. So I would actually avoid the 40 minutes uh, before. But if you take it five to 10 minutes before, then like insulin has no chance to go up. Um, and it's, it's virtually risk free. Or if you took the, um, took the gel from maybe 70 minutes out and then took very small uh, sips of it uh, throughout, that would also work. But I would not take that risk. I would just do it like 10 minutes before. Thanks, Oscar. Um, next question comes in from Caroline Cavanaugh. Uh, why do you prefer C90 versus C30? I guess that, that may speak to um, a little bit to the modularity. Maybe you could talk a little just briefly about the, the modularity of our products as well, the mix and match and the modularity of yeah. how the products can be built into different, or the products can be served to serve different purposes. Yeah. So, I mean, the reason that I prefer the product is just for practical uh, reasons. So um, it's, it's basically it's three units in, in one bottle. Um, and like on long, longer bike rides, it's, it's just great. I don't need to stop to, uh, to refill. I don't need to make up new, uh, new drinks. So it's just purely for practical reasons that I like that, uh, like that drink. Um, uh, of course I can, I can also use C30s and I can use, uh, gels, but, um, for, for me, uh, C90 is like, instead of one bottle of C30 drink and taking two gels, um, I, I prefer to have just the one bottle and one, only one thing to, uh, to think about. Um, now, of course, the, the way that the whole system uh, works with, with Never Second is that uh, every product uh, or every, every serving has a unit um, or uh, the C90 has, uh, has three units. And you start with determining what is your target for the day and the target if it's really hard training or racing could be 90 uh, per hour uh, very often it could be 60 uh, per hour or maybe uh, 30 grams per hour and then you just pick the units that make this practical for you if you uh, cannot carry a bottle if you're doing a very long run and you don't want to carry bottles well you need different solution um then maybe the gels are a better idea. Um, and then if you can organize water somewhere along the way, then yeah, combine the gels with some water. Um, so yeah, it's we have this um, like pretty simple uh, system where you just select how many units you need um, and you just make a plan based on what your preferences are. And then what we haven't really talked about is the hydration part. You can do some calculations of how much fluid you actually need to uh, need to take, and you build that into the into the equation as well. Absolutely. But maybe that's for a future uh, webinar. The question from Eric Simon Strick. Uh, question is: Is there a limit of carbohydrate intake with Never Second C90? So right, right now he's taking, Eric is taking in 120 to 150 grams an hour. He's a big never second advocate. I you know I, <laughs> Eric and Simon and I communicate a bit. Um, so I guess he's asking, is there a limit? I think that comes to the question of optimized, like maybe you could talk briefly on that, Oscar. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure there really is a, um, there is a, um, a limit. Um, but whether the, ratio if, if you're taking that much 120 to 150 grams uh, an, an hour then i think the ratio of two to one is probably not the most optimal so i would i would then probably have something as a little bit closer to one one to one um if if you're taking 90 grams an hour two to one is better i think if you go higher then maybe adding a little bit of fructose to the this mix would 
uh, could probably help a little bit because the limitation is going to be in the glucose absorption. Now, having said that, I know quite a few people who, who take more than 120, also professional cyclists, 120 grams, more than 120 grams an hour with never second problems and never have a problem. Um, so it would be interesting to uh, to actually test that and measure uh, the oxidation. No one, no one's really done that. So. Thank you, Oscar. Uh, good time for a few more questions. This one comes in from Chris Melman, also a huge fan of the brand. Hi, Chris. Question is, um, what do you think about mouth rinse? I've never used this. I, I'm sorry, I have never used this as your product. Products go down super easily. And my stomach can handle pretty much anything at this time, but I wonder if there is a benefit for me before carbs are even absorbed. Um, yes. So um, I think for those on the on the call who don't know the sort of the backstory to the uh, to the mouth rinse, I'll, I'll tell that uh, story. Um, and it started with a study that we did. Oh gosh, it was back in I think ninety seven, or it got published in ninety seven. In that study, we did a 40 kilometer time trial with, a, with cyclists and we gave them a carbohydrate drink, just a normal carbohydrate drink, and we compared it with a placebo. And we had 20, 20 cyclists in that uh, study. I, I was convinced that the duration was just not long enough for the carbohydrate to have an effect. So I, I was really convinced we weren't going to find anything. Um, carbohydrate isn't really limiting in that uh, that sort of um, uh, dur that sort of duration of exercise and also that high intensity. Surprisingly, we found that the the ones that received the carbohydrate were one minute faster in their time trial. And so then that was really puzzling because we couldn't explain why why it had worked. So we then designed a study, like a laboratory study, where we infused glucose directly into the blood, and we asked them to do the same time trial again. So this time, they really they had no idea what was being infused, whether it was uh, just saline or uh, glucose, and we asked them to do the time trial, and no effect on performance. We had delivered the same or even more carbohydrate directly into the blood and it had no effect. But if we, in the study before, when they were drinking it, it had an effect, quite a substantial effect of one minute. So we then designed a third study. And in that third study, and we now we get to the mouth rinse, we asked them to take the drink and then rinse their mouth with it and then spit out the drink. So they were not allowed to swallow any of the drink. So in this case, there was contact with the carbohydrate and the, uh, the inside of the mouth. Um, but we were not delivering any of the carbohydrate. And in that study, we saw a one minute improvement in time trial performance. So what we think happens is the carbohydrate gets detected in the mouth and immediately a, a signal goes to the brain and it tells your brain, oh, there's carbohydrate coming. You can start to feel better and push a little bit more power. Um, so in the studies after that, we actually put people in the MRI in a magnet and we could show that with a carbohydrate mouth rinse, certain areas of the brain became active that were not active with a placebo. We also showed that um, like artificial sweetener didn't have that same effect. It seemed to be like very specific carbohydrate effect. So um, that's a very long way to say a carbohydrate mouth rinse in some conditions can work. Um, so you're not describing, uh, Chris, here, the, uh, the, actually the situation exactly where you're going to use it. If uh, we, we've shown this effect in like one hour all out exercise, this is where it works. If it is more prolonged, then yeah, the, there is not a huge amount of evidence, but also because those studies haven't been done. Um, I know that a lot of athletes do use it sometimes when they go on like fasted ride, fat burning rides where they're not taking carbohydrates. 
and they still want to maintain the intensity, they then uh, rinse, rinse them out with carbohydrate to maintain the, uh, the power output. But um, very few studies to really confirm that. We have another question, Oscar, from uh, American Gravel Channel, <laughs> Lauren de Crescenzo. Uh, thanks for joining, Lauren, yeah. as well. Yeah. Question is, <clears throat> do you see any benefit of adding protein or solid food in longer events where you're skipping meals. Lauren does a lot of long event riding. So what's your perspective on, on protein uh, overall, Oscar, on those longer events? Yeah, it really comes down to the definition of how long is long. <clears throat> um, because I think anything, I would almost say anything under 24 hours, um, I'm not sure it's really needed. Any, any protein if it's longer than that i think there, there you could really make a case for protein um <clears throat> in uh, long events like under under 24 hours um i would sort of hesitate increasing the protein content very much because mostly because the most important thing is delivering uh, fuel to the uh, to the muscle and increasing the protein content is going to reduce the delivery of fuel to the to the muscle and also the, the delivery of uh, fluid. Um, <clears throat> but I think it's it's also looking at uh, this from a case by uh, on, a, on a case by case basis. So uh, it also depends a little bit on what what is happening the day or the days after. Um, so I've answered this now as if. That's the event, and then there's two weeks of a break, and maybe I'll answer it slightly differently if there is something else coming uh, within a week. So, fantastic! Thanks, Oscar. Uh, we have another question from uh, Billy Pierce, who I believe I met at TRE. Billy asks, uh, "Thank you for the explanation of carbohydrate uptake. Now <clears throat> that the subject of electrolytes has been brought up, are there plans for a future uh, webinar on the subject?" Absolutely, uh, Billy. Oscar and I talk about uh, electrolytes pretty frequently. Oscar has very, um, I would say, strong and valid opinions on uh, electrolytes, and it's something that uh, we definitely will be having uh, separate webinars on. Oscar, did you have anything to add to that? No, I think it's a really good, a really good topic to, uh, yeah, just go go through what, what is the actual evidence and why do we have such a strong belief that we need electrolytes, um, and there are definitely situations where electrolytes are important. Uh, so I'm not saying that we should never have electrolytes or, or something, something like that. Our products have electrolytes. There is a role for it. But I think the whole topic is a little bit, um, it is definitely a little bit overhyped. And um, yeah, it'd be, it'd be great to uh, discuss it in a little bit more detail um, because it does need a little bit of time to explain it. It's, uh, and it's also, it's a little bit more technical. Thanks, Oscar. We have uh, time for two more questions. Um, <clears throat> this one is, I think, a really, a really good one. It comes from Stephen Redwood, and it's a, it's a question we get asked all the time. It says, are fluid absorption rates independent of carbohydrate absorption rates? Many athletes obsess over the importance of balance between carbohydrate, fluid, and electrolytes. I have to say, personally, I, this is one of the most challenging questions to answer because it gets asked or variations of it get asked all the time. Oscar, maybe you could just provide our insight on, on how an athlete should approach uh, carbohydrate, fluid, and electrolyte when planning. How should yep. they be thinking about it? Yeah, I think the sort of the cause for this, well, it's not even confusion, but it's this uh, strong belief that people uh, people have is it's really that the way research is done, uh, and, and this is how all researchers work, and I've worked for many, uh, many years as well, you isolate the problem, you control everything around that problem that you can control, and then you're looking at that problem only. Um, so, for example, if I'm interested in uh, fluid absorption, I'm going to control everything around it, and I'm going to figure out what, is the, what are the things I need to do to improve fluid absorption. And then you get um, you you get in one study that will show you uh, if your carbohydrate content is higher, you're going to impair your fluid delivery. Well, that's correct. I think there are lots of studies that uh, that show that. Now, <clears throat> this is where the the translation from science to practice 
uh, comes in because that finding in itself is meaningless Be unless the only thing you're ever interested in is like that scientist who's only interested in hydration but I think as an athlete, you're not only interested in hydration, you're interested in performance. And performance is partly depending on hydration, but it's also partly dependent on carbohydrate intake and partly depending on a lot of other factors. So you need to make a decision that takes all of those factors into account and not just hydration. The same, um, we have the same uh, question that also comes up uh, quite often about osmolality. What is the osmolality of your product? Well, depends a little bit on the, uh, well, I can tell you what the osmolality is, but is, is that important? Because it depends a little bit on the context. You can have like the perfectly designed drink that is isotonic with the exact same osmolality as the blood which in theory should help absorption of fluid. But if you then eat that with a bar and a banana and something else, um, your stomach content is not going to be isotonic. So we have to look at sort of the practical situation a little bit more than just the isolated findings of some scientific studies. So the solution, I think, is to approach the problem in two parts. Um, the two most important things are hydration, how much fluid do I need, and how much carbohydrate do I need? Actually, I would turn them around because I think carbohydrate is, in most situations, more important than fluid. So you, you calculate your carbohydrate needs. And so we've gone through like the simple version of that in this, um, in, in this webinar. It's really dependent on the exercise duration. So 30, 60, or 90 grams uh, per hour. Then how much fluid you need? Well, that really depends on how much you sweat. And we all know, and we all know people who sweat lots. And we also know people who sweat very little. And then a lot of people sweat somewhere in between. Usually people know whether they are heavy sweaters or light sweaters or, or something in, in between. But if you really want to calculate your fluid needs, you need to measure how much you're sweating. And fortunately, it's pretty easy to do. You step on a scale before your training, after the training, and the difference, um, if we do it really simply, is your is how much you've sweat. Um, you need to correct that for all the fluid and, and everything that you've consumed because that would have increased your, uh, your weight. Um, but you can calculate sweat rate like that. Um, you can then uh, calculate also how much fluid you're allowed to use because dehydration is something we want to prevent. But at the same time, I also want to prevent that I finish with the same body weight that I started with because that's pointless. It is okay to get dehydrated a little bit. And in a lot of activities, actually beneficial if I'm lighter at the finish than when I'm heavier at the finish. And at all costs, we want to prevent that we're increasing, we're drinking so much that we're increasing our weight. But we also want to avoid that we get dehydrated so much that our physiology uh, deteriorates. So it is finding out like what is the amount of weight that I can lose without having any negative effects. Now, if you combine those two, you have a perfect plan in terms of you know how, how much fluid and you know how much carbohydrate you need to take. And then the next step is translating that to products. And <clears throat> this is something that maybe I didn't stress enough. It, it is then really important that the products that you combine actually can work together. Um, because if, for example, I have some solid food that has some carbohydrate composition that I don't know about and then I combine it with a uh, an ever second gel and then I combine it with a banana and I combine it with something else do we then know what the glucose fructose ratio is and is there a chance that it's not two to one there's a, there's a big chance of course so that's why we've developed this as a system of products 
And then regardless of which combination of those products you use, you just know that it will always work together. So that's the yeah, long, long answer to, I think, very important question. Thanks, Oscar. We have, we appreciate it. I think um, we have time for one more question. I know it's uh, getting quite late in uh, Europe, and so uh, some folks are probably eyeing um, their, uh, their beds soon. So <laughs> we'll ask one more question. Uh, this question is um, from uh, Daniel Weiss. He says, are there any BCAAs in your sports drinks? As far as I found, there's no real benefit. Can you comment on the value of BCAAs in sports drinks? Marking a very short answer to that one, because I think you, yeah, you, you are right. If you say uh, there's no real benefit, it's, it's one of those things that is incredibly overhyped. There's a huge industry behind sort of BCAAs and promoting it, but uh, there really is no, no evidence what, whatsoever. And not just in the sports drink, but in, in general, um, like even for uh, like, there, there really is no reason to have it uh, in the sports drink that that's like, and, and studies also show that the, uh, no effect whatsoever. Um, but you could maybe come up with a reason why we would need it in our protein product. Uh, but even that, is that really no no evidence if you if you really want to optimize protein synthesis after exercise you do need branch chain amino acids but you also need all of the other amino acids so why not give a really complete protein that contains the amount of branch chain amino acids that you need so that you don't need to add extra branch chain amino acids so you could make some suboptimal protein mix maybe and add in branch chain amino acids, but why not get an optimal protein mix in the first place? So. Thanks, Oscar. We can always uh, rely on you for a, a solid source of truth. So thank you for that. It's always very helpful. Appreciate it. Um, I think we it's getting quite late. So uh, first of all, Oscar, I want to say thanks so much for, uh, for hosting the webinar. It's fascinating as usual. Um, I think we got to... We had roughly 35 questions. We, I'm, for any folks who uh, we were not able to uh, answer your question, uh, we'll be taking those questions offline and we'll answer you uh, by email. Uh, likewise, if you have any specific questions for us, I think one of the values um, that we uh, uh, like to offer at Never Second is educational value as an educational resource. Uh, so if you have any questions at any point, you can feel free to uh, email us at hello at never2, N-E-V-E-R 2.com. Uh, we do uh, endeavor to respond uh, very quickly. And um, uh, so we always want to be a resource for you. Uh, secondarily, um, we uh, will be sending you a follow-up email in the coming week or so. Uh, one of the one of the um, questions we received was about other additional webinars that we're going to be offering. So our plan as a brand is to offer webinars uh, monthly. Um, aside from this webinar, which is a bit kind of a, a baseline um, tool for athletes, coaches, and nutritionists, uh, we'll be offering much more topical, uh, in-depth webinars throughout the course of the year. You'll receive an email from us uh, outlining. Uh, typically three months in advance, and uh, you're welcome to register at any time. We, we look forward to, uh, to uh, catching you at our future webinars. Thanks again uh, for your time, and uh, have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.